Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrologer with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a psychological astrologer as well as an analytical hypnotherapist. And today I'm joined by Martha Alter Hines. Hello, Martha. Hello, thank you. So I came across you through Melanie, the wonderful Melanie Reinhardt, mm. who is taking part in a symposium that you are holding. Um, from the 1st to the 30th of June. And it is, it is free for everyone to, to join. So I was curious. Tell us more. It's called Becoming the One. Yeah, Rebecoming the One. Yeah. Um, this is a symposium that uh, came to me in a vision, essentially, on my 45th birthday last year. 2000 or 2022 March 5th 2022 the day I turned 45 and three days before my birthday I had had my third pass of my Uranus opposition and so on my birthday and lots of other things astrologically were happening right around then but on my birthday itself I had this feeling of a like a lightning bolt so Uranian <laughs> come straight through my body and then this vision flashed in front of my eyes of and the whole structure of the symposium um and then a, the spirit world said to me do it <laughs> and so what the symposium what the structure of this was and the purpose of it is is to hold space collectively for the healing around our relationships to gender and sexuality um and specifically to do it in a way that brings together people of all genders, people of all sexual orientations, um, and all walks of life. Because what I see in, in the world is that there's a lot of conversation about the reemergence of the feminine, like, like a lot of people are very interested in goddess asteroids, for example, in astrology, right? Which is something I'm very passionate about. And I, I'm an astrologer, and I have an entire year-long goddess series. So I'm, I fully... <laughs> understand that passion and then um and then people who typically identify as men there's are very into you know the men's movement and the healing around the masculine which is also wonderful uh but i don't see much in the world that brings those two together and then i also don't see much in the world that brings together this healing of the the feminine and the masculine or the inner feminine and the inner masculine or the divine feminine the divine masculine in a container that is explicitly uh, inclusive of and celebratory of people of or all of our gender identities and all of our sexual orientations, whatever they happen to be. If you're straight, if you're not, it, whatever it is. Um, so that's that's the overarching goal and purpose of the symposium. So I held the first one last June, 2022. And um, there were 42 speakers, probably about half of them were astrologers, some very well-known ones, um, and, <clears throat> and 1,400 people participated. And then I got a lot of feedback from participants saying hundreds of people writing me, this changed my life. Um, I didn't realize I even needed this. Thank you so much, you know, on and on and on. And so essentially the request was to do it again. But uh, this year, what participants have said is, please, please uh, give us a little less content, but longer, a longer period of time to digest it. And so this year, I was aiming for 20 to 25 speakers, but it's turning into about 33. <laughs> so it's not that much less. <laughs> But last year it was uh, held over eight days. This year it's held over that entire month that you mentioned. So um, part of my background is that for decades I was a clinical social worker and a psychotherapist and I specialized in the treatment of trauma and attachment. So I have the very strong grounding in what it takes to hold a therapeutically sound safe environment um not that this is therapy it's not therapy but the way i'm structuring everything is to try to very consciously um 
give give the space the most potential possible to truly be healing for the collective, for individuals, but really for the collective. I think we can say it's not therapy, but we know that it's therapeutic. And I think yes. that that's the aim of certainly my work and many an astrologer's work is that um, outside of my actual official therapy sessions, the astrology um, sessions are therapeutic and clients continually tell me so. So I think it's not beyond the realms of possibility that people attending talks and symposiums are touched by what they're hearing and that it can be for some life-changing. Um, mm -hmm. so that's a, a very exciting um, thing to consider when you're putting something like this together. Just coming back, because I think when I'm teaching astrology, there is always an emphasis on understanding the essence of masculine energy and feminine energy and how it plays out within each and every individual. So this is not related to an individual sex or their identification. It is to do with energy. And, and I think it's, it's very important that we understand both sides because if we don't understand both sides within ourselves, then there's something in us that's not being expressed, that's being repressed. Yes, absolutely, yeah. For me, for example, I have my Venus in Aries, right? So, so typically, you know, when I th think back on my life, there are a lot of things I do or qualities I have that you could consider masculine, sort of. I mean, I tend to be a leader. I tend to be very um, go-getter and do it and, you know, all of those things. Uh, but when I really went deeply into my own inner feminine masculine relationship in myself I realized actually no that is just how my feminine expresses itself it's very powerful and my masculine has a different quality to it so anyway yes and that helped me realize that's not me being masculine that's my version of being feminine <laughs> or you know one of them I mean I think we have infinite versions of all of it but yeah I think you know I for ages and ages it seems that I didn't see my Mars energy. Mm -hmm. Same. For so long, I never saw my Mars energy. Mm -hmm. And yet I look back and it was so obviously there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had one or two astrology, astrologers point out how incredibly strong my Mars is. Now, mm -hmm. as it happens, it's not the strongest planet in my chart from a traditional astrological perspective um actually venus is stronger uh, it's mm -hmm. the strongest one but when i look at it the way it's placed i know why they've said that mm -hmm. and and yet for so long i couldn't see it and to not see it to not see that masculine energy meant that i wasn't appreciating what something that was inside and yeah. that was already expressing itself without me knowing it. So it was an unconscious, this is what I wanted to say. It was an unconscious expression. And that can get us into trouble when we're unconsciously expressing something that's there. Yes, and same, so I have, so Mars actually is the ruler of my South Node. My South Node is in Aries. And um, so it, my Mars theoretically is very, uh, important, right? But it, my Mars also happens to be an Aquarius. And when I, again, when I did my own kind of journey with my own inner feminine and masculine, I realized once again, I thought, I thought what I would find inside myself is that my masculine had been dominant because I, again, I have these qualities that are leadership and all of that kind of thing. Um, but I found the opposite. I found that inside of me, it's really the feminine that had taken over and my masculine had been taking a back seat and just kind of waiting and watching like, like an Aquarian, you know, sort of just 
distant, almost dissociated version of the masculine, but but very present. I mean, actually very present. It's just, I had forgotten about him. <laughs> so then when I, again, did this inner work um, and realized I had forgotten about my masculine, then the two came together. And, and then over the last few years, it's been like this getting to know my inner masculine, which is radically changed my life right so um yeah fascinating and really it feels really important we come back to the idea of the alchemical king and queen and the the quest being for the un union of masculine and feminine i think we can do no better work than to do that first and foremost within ourselves mm -hmm. so that we are actually operating in a way that's honoring every part of us yeah absolutely so tell us about how you feel we might be able to begin that integration of the two within ourselves yeah i think um like with many things it start where the client is right start where you are <laughs> so, so that's hard to name uh because i think it would be so different for every person but and actually this this is related to many of the talks in the symposium um one thing that's coming to mind is a really simple thing that i did and i do and one of the speakers, Maura McBratney, is going to be talking about is there's a really simple practice you can do in yourself. Um, like one one way to do it is to have two pillows <laughs> and one you sit on one pillow and you go into yourself and imagine being your inner feminine. And then you sit on the other pillow and imagine being your inner masculine. Uh, and you can, and you don't have to do it that way, but that's just one idea. And then you can journal, you could journal, you could take a piece of paper and on one side say, you know, masculine, feminine, whatever. And you can even have a third column that is, let's say Martha, or you could have a fourth column that is inner child. I mean, you can do this in infinite number of ways, but if you just want to simplify and just have the inner feminine, the inner masculine, um, <clears throat> you could start out asking them a question really simple, like, how are you today? What are you feeling? And then let, you know, go, go from one pillow to the other and let journal, let them each answer. And for me, it was fascinating what came out and what, what they each needed. Um, so like, if I would come to a point where I was grappling with some challenge of some kind, it was really fascinating that my feminine would have one perspective on it and my masculine would have a different perspective. And then they had different ways they could help each other and um, dialogue with each other. And uh, yeah, and, and for some people, you know, when they come into this inner dialogue, there's there's a need to work out the dynamics between the two. That wasn't so much the case with me. It was more like, my feminine had forgotten my masculine existed. <laughs> so then they needed to just come back together and then they needed to repair in that sense, not so much like that there was conflict, it's just that they needed to actually join back together. Um, yeah, and it, it's a very non-linear, non-rational experience, right? So for me, at least. Um, so that's one idea, but I think there's so many ways. And if we're looking at a birth chart, where would you start with looking at this need or how, how would you identify the need for integration of the two? How would you identify a potential imbalance? Well, again, I think I would personally start with the person. So what I, the way I approach astrology is, is, you know, it's a reflection of course of the inner world, right? So, so for me, for example, I discovered that I felt like 
my masculine had been forgotten, but, but in reality, my masculine and feminine have a pretty harmonious relationship. So if you look at my chart, my masculine and uh, my Mars and my Venus are in a sextile. So they have a pretty harmonious astrological relationship to each other, even though you could see astrologically how my feminine could be really dominant. She's right on my South node, <laughs> um, in Aries happens to be ruled by my Mars actually, but my Mars is in Aquarius. So I can see how my Mars might've been dissociated in some way, but the reality is my Mars and my Venus are in this very strong relationship with each other because again, my South node and Venus are conjunct ruled by my Mars <laughs> and my Mars and my Venus are in a sextile. So, um, so I wouldn't, I would want to, I would want to start with the inner journey and then look at the at astrology rather than the other way around personally. But I do feel like then, the, then looking at my chart, it, I could really be informed by that. And I could, it fleshed out what I had already found inside myself. Um, I also, one of the, in the symposium, there are going to be uh, 14 optional paid workshops. One of them is going to be with Kelly Hunter. And she's going to be doing a workshop on um, the feminine in the birth chart, looking at the moon, Venus, and Black Moon Lilith in combination with each other. So I'm really excited to see how she explores that. That's not so much the feminine and the masculine together, but that's more diving into the feminine um and then uh Ari Moshe Wolf another astrologer my main astrology teacher other than Heather Ensworth he's going to be doing a workshop on the Aries Libra axis in the chart and so that's not explicitly masculine feminine but it's related um and another thing actually that I personally look at a lot in the chart is the asteroids, the Kuiper Belt objects, uh, these are bringing in, you know, so many other layers of the masculine feminine dynamic. Oh, and actually, <laughs> Kelly Hunter, her free talk in the symposium is amazing. It's on cosmic couples. I think you would love it. <laughs> so, so she, she goes through, uh, various layers of the masculine feminine relationship in the cosmos so she starts with mars and venus and then she works her way up to manway and varda um and you know including in there is like Chericlo and chiron and different quote-unquote couples so and she uses those groupings of those pairs as ways to explore various layers of the masculine feminine dynamic in astrology so beautiful so 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 beautiful um, another couple that I have, I've been drawn to that she didn't talk about in her talk is for example, Psyche and Eros, you know, as being like a different octave of Venus and Mars. So depending on what sort of pops out at me in a chart, I would look at various facets of all of that. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question, but <laughs> does um and i was just thinking really actually one of the reasons why this is important is is two well is two that i can see immediately the first obviously is understanding ourselves better and understanding our inner energies and balancing them out so that we're in a harmonious frame of mind which then brings me to the second question uh, the second reason why this is important which would be that when we are able to do that within ourselves, then we are in a better position to relate to others in harmony. Yes, absolutely. For sure. That's true for anything. Absolutely. Yes. And, and I would say um, specifically with the masculine feminine dynamic, I mean, if we're talking about having that, relationship with the inner masculine feminine this is a, a topic that gets brought up a lot in the talks in the symposium something i've found in again my own life but i've seen this with other, a lot of other people is 
when I then, when I build, build my relationship with my inner masculine in particular, I identify as a woman. So, uh, and I often have relationships with men. So what I've found is that when I really strengthen my relationship to my inner masculine, I suddenly am not looking outside of myself nearly as much for whatever it is I want from quote unquote, the masculine. And I feel much more complete, much more grounded, centered, calm, peaceful. Um, like I've got it, I've got it right here. <laughs> so, you know, not that I don't want a relationship outside of myself. I do, but uh, it's not as, it's not such an intense need. I think really what we're, what we're saying is that when we have that balance within ourselves, it takes the pressure off mm. because we're not looking for someone to fulfill a need. What we're looking for is connection. Yeah. And very different thing. And I think at the heart of so many issues that people have within relationships, it comes when the other party is not fulfilling a need. So there's an expectation that a need is going to be met which the person themselves don't even properly understand, um, but they, they're not happy because that needs not being, been met. Whereas if the pressure is taken off the relationship in that sense, then what you have is the potential for real intimacy and real connection. So it's, it's important to make that distinction and to say, actually, there is a good reason why relationships do better if they're not based on need mm -hmm. it, it's this is um perhaps a how can i put this a more emotionally mature um way of relating to another person so yet again the more we understand ourselves the better we understand ourselves the better our relationships are going to be because they're going to be much more about connection Absolutely. And I think there are certain needs that we absolutely even biologically have for connection. I and mean, that is a need that is like, we know from the, those of us who took psychology, you know, developmental psychology ever in college, those experiments, those horrible experiments with the monkeys and the, you know, the Bulby, uh, terrible, terrible experiments. But we know that as beings of life, we need other we need connection with other beings of life. That's just true. So I, I don't want to imply that that we don't have needs from others. We definitely do. But uh, but I think we can, when we have that inner relationship going on and that inner healing, we can get to the point where we can distinguish, we can be very cl much more clear about um, these are needs that I can get met in myself. And now, and yes, I have, a need or a desire that really can only get met in a relationship, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, it's not a dire need, but it is, it is, a, it is a clear need that I, you know, I can't explore certain things about life or about myself by myself. That's just true. Um, we can't grow by ourselves mm -hmm. we in relationship with others yeah. in order to understand ourselves and to have that reflection back um from others so we absolutely need relationship um, and relationships of varying kinds but we need we need relationships but what we're talking about is looking to that relationship to fulfill something specific uh, that's not a simple desire for connection and growth and learning that you do with other people this is about something else and, and, and you hear it, you know, people saying, you know, this person doesn't make me happy or, you know, you hear those vague statements and that's, that's a relationship that's in trouble because there's something going on here that's not necessarily about the other person, but that it's about the individual expressing that. So this is where understanding that need to balance 
different energies within us is so important and how astrology can be so helpful in getting us that insight we need to get started. Absolutely. Definitely. And another, oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I was going to bring in another astrological phenomenon that's going on this year that I've been noticing that's very related to the symposium and, and what we're talking about here. Um, so again, you know, bringing in the asteroids, for example, the asteroid Eros uh, was conjunct Pluto when Pluto entered Aquarius. And it's also going to be opposite Venus in July of 2023 when Venus goes retrograde. So, so I've been just observing <laughs> um, this phenomenon happening with Eros. Oh, and also Eros and Hygieia are in a dance this whole year pretty much. And they were squaring um, this latest eclipse that we just had, the the, the one in May. Um, so there's some very powerful thing around uh, the potential, the way I feel it is, there's a powerful potential for us also to hold space for or transform our relationship to sexuality, to like the essence of what Eros is. And for me, Eros would be probably uh, just life force energy, source energy. So again, going back to relationships, you know, and the, 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 the nodes switching into Aries and Libra, especially with Libra being the South node and being in evolutionary astrology, the resolution node with the square of Pluto to the nodes, right? That we, in so many ways, but including with our, our relationship to our sexuality, we can outsource our power to another person. And we, mm, I think a lot of us might be having a knowing in us that there's some change that's wanting to emerge in us in many, many ways, but I think for a lot of us also with regard to sexuality. And so I can feel and see that that knowing that that change is potentially here in a lot of people and a lot of my friends and um, and what I notice in a lot of, of my female women identified friends who are in long-term partnerships, for example, there can be this restlessness and frustration like there's like I think they feel it in them that there's this change there's this potential for to really come into my interpretation of what's going on I think <laughs> is there's this potential to come into the reality that we are the life force of source itself right and that's the essence of sexual energy and so but if we're in a relationship and we're we have these social constructs that my sexuality is tied to my partner and our my partnership looks like this and acts like this and this is the way I interact with my sexual energy but I'm feeling something wanting to change in me it would be really easy to get angry at the partner because the structure of the relationship isn't holding space for that energy to move in me right and then it could I mean all kinds of things are possible but it could be easy to then feel like oh I'm supposed to go and have an affair or would I leave this relationship when I think I think there's a potential and I would never want to generalize for everybody ever <laughs> but I think there's a potential when we then come back to the reality that it's all here it's right here the change that wants to happen is in us right it's it's our relationship to this life force of source I think that's wanting to emerge and, and show itself as what it really is. That has nothing to do with the partner in a sense. Um, and they can't possibly make it possible for us to have this change occur in ourselves or, or this potential to take shape. It's really about us being in ourself in a way that holds space for it. And then, um, and then the partnership certainly can can interact with that, but it's not it's not something that we can blame the partner for it not happening. That no, makes sense. 
to understand what is happening within ourselves so that we can communicate that need. And this is where relationships often go astray is because we are not in ourselves understanding what we need and what's happening. And we're expecting something we don't know what, and we're looking to the other person and we're looking and we're finding fault with the other person when the other person hasn't got a clue because we haven't got a clue. So we need to always start here. So I think that's um, a very interesting um, observation. And it's making me think about the sacral chakra as well. Um, Mm -hmm. So, which is all about that that energy of abundance and creativity and the link with sexuality. So I think there is a very, we are divine beings in the sense that we all have that spark of divinity within us. And if we are frustrated, it may be because we are not actually acting as creators. We've got stuck Mm -hmm. and find a way of expressing that creative energy and and maybe we just need to create more and and create something new and something different and if we're not doing it it may have nothing to do with our partners or our relationship we need to examine what stopping is really and truly so that we're able to access that and be the powerful creators that we are meant to be Absolutely. And co-creators with the earth, co-creators with source. Yeah. Co-creators with each other. And yes. Yeah. I love that. Yes. So I think then um, people now should be wanting to dive into a link uh, for this symposium and also to learn more about what you do. So Martha, how can they do that? Yeah. um, The, well, I will give you a link to specifically take people to the symposium but the simplest way for me to explain verbally how to get there is if you go to my website which is living the one light.com um there the, the first thing on the page is a link to the symposium and so so like we've been saying the symposium itself is entirely free there are going to be over 30 free talks four free panel discussions um and a free online community discussion forum so that's all entirely free it's it's going to be available indefinitely it's not one of the summits where you you have 48 hours and then you need to buy a a vip upgrade to keep watching It, it it will just be there and actually the entire symposium from last year is also still available and free and when you sign up for this year's symposium there's a link that can that takes you to last year's if you're interested um and then separately but also linked within the free part is, is this, the optional paid workshops. Um, and yeah, but living the one light.com is the simplest way to and, find it. Well, I'll be putting a link to that in the description box. Thank you so much, Martha, for your time today. Thank you so much for supporting this and being in, interested. And <laughs> yeah, I really, really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And thank you all for watching. Um, Next time, we're going to be looking at the symbolic language of astrology. And before then, do remember that you can check out my own website for um, courses that I'm running. And there's some that are starting uh, in June. Until next time, goodbye.